Hey, this is Dominic, and this is your home for the cutting edge conversations on optimizing your personal performance, lighting up your sex life, and living a purpose driven life of your own design. These are the topics that Dominic and I have both struggled with in our own lives and still don't always get right. This is Brian. Welcome to the Great Man Podcast. Well, after 170 episodes of talk about purpose, porn, sexual performance, racial inequities, menstrual cycles, and menopause, we finally decided to tackle the last great taboo, money. It's hard to believe, but yes, this is in fact our very first money-focused discussion on the Great Man Within podcast, and boy, do we have a doozy in store for you. That's because we have one of the most visible and respected leaders in the financial independence movement joining us today, my old college buddy and great man mastermind brother, Brad Barrett. More on him in a moment. Now, if you haven't heard of the financial independence or FI movement, you're missing out. The FI movement is a global community of millions of ordinary citizens breaking free from financial drift and making intentional decisions with their money. And get this, within a period of 5 to 15 years, they have so much money saved that they can choose whether or not they ever want to work again. Members of the FI community are hitting independence in their 40s, 30s, or even sometimes in their 20s. And most of these people are not extraordinary earners. Many of them are teachers, accountants, hairdressers, union workers, or other typical middle-class professions. It sounds impossible, right? Or at least it must require some superhuman level of savings and deprivation, like downsizing your family to a one-bedroom studio and allocating toilet paper square allotments. Au contraire, my friends, it's quite the opposite. While achieving financial independence does require intentionality and discipline, it does not necessitate you giving up all of your life's pleasures to become a frugal weirdo who eats brown bananas. Instead, Brad Barrett today will be teaching us how the choice to begin your journey to financial independence is not only exciting, it has the potential to become one of the most meaningful inner work experiences of your life. And that ultimately leads to freedom. So who is Brad Barrett? Well, Brad Barrett is the co-host of the Choose FI podcast. And again, FI stands for Financial Independence, which is an astoundingly popular financially focused podcast. And beyond that, it's one of the most popular podcasts in the world. Put it this way. There are 850,000 podcasts on the interwebs today. And Choose FI is one of the top 500 most downloaded. That puts it in the 0.0006% of all podcasts or six basis points for you math geeks, Brad and his wife, Laura, and their two young daughters achieved financial independence before the age of 40, which means they've saved enough money to live off the interest of their savings, and that totally covers their yearly expenses. Now, if you've read my new Bach, my new book, my new Bach, you'll get it if you, you know the inside joke. If you've read my new book, On Purpose Leadership, you already know about Brad because I featured him in the chapter outlining how to identify and follow your greatest energy, which is what Brad did to not only achieve financial independence for himself, but to become one of the pillars of the movement. So in this episode, you're going to learn what is financial independence and the why behind committing to this lifestyle of living. Why Brad calls money the last great taboo, why not taking command of your financial decisions leads to a lifetime of living on the knife's edge of losing your personal autonomy, why and how you need to stop seeing saving money as deprivation and instead see it as your path to freedom. Brad goes through the math about how to figure out exactly what your life costs and the basic math behind how you can calculate your personal financial independence number. And also stick around to the very end because one of the new practices I'm going to be implementing in the outro is leaving you with a call to action, which is something that I learned from Brad's community of 70,000 Facebook followers that one of the top things they appreciate about the Choose FI podcast is there's always a call to action to to take a 1% 
change, 1% difference in your life. And doing that time and time again leads to some major tipping points. So stick around for the outro. I'll be giving you a call to action that you could take from this episode. So enjoy our interview today on your path to financial independence featuring Brad Barrett. Brian, I don't know how many episodes we've recorded on this, on the Great Man Within podcast. I think we're up over 170 now. It's unbelievable to imagine that this is our first ever conversation around money and finances. How did you let that happen, man? Like, what, what the hell's been your prop? <laughs> we have no problem talking about masturbation and porn and sex and relationships and what we should eat, what we shouldn't eat, and nighttime routines and relationships with parents and loved ones. But we haven't talked about what I would think is a major pillar of life, which is finances. Like, this is the, here, here's a new edge for all. We've talked about periods and, and menopause. That's like, right. We covered, <laughs> we've covered the, the topics here, but here's a new edge for us. And now we're finally talking about money. Who better and, and what more uncomfortable way to bring a guest on to the show to talk about it? Brad Barrett of Choose FI fame. Welcome to the show, man. Guys, thanks so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. And money is the last great taboo. I mean, think about all these things you guys talk about. And yet 170 plus episodes in and you're just talking about money now. I mean, I mean there's something more there. I've noticed when I go into, let's call it, my friends in the spiritual space, we'll talk about everything in life, masculine and feminine energies and meditation and everything else, but don't bring up money. Yes. And when we go into the like sexual forward thinking groups, we can talk about sex and the taboos and how comfortable we are, but do not bring up money. So when you say this as a taboo, that resonates. Yeah. 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 My mentor, Lisa O'Neill from New Zealand, she said that she has a friend who's a, who's a bit cagey and she, she likes to go to dinner parties. And like when it's like all awkward and stuff, she'll sit down and say, so uh, when was the last time you had sex and how much money did you make last year? <laughs> like those are her first two questions because it's like the two most taboo things. And then like, that's what makes a dinner party. Well, Brad, we're going to be having our own little dinner party here over this conversation. How about we start somewhere simple for our audience? Because let's just assume that there are many men in our listenership who don't know what what is financial independence, right? Like, what, like can you define that for us? And then let's get into your story about what led you to financial independence and, and the movement and the size of it that you and Jonathan are bringing to this world. Yeah, I think financial independence is ultimately a point where you do not need to work for money anymore. So that's kind of the the broadest sense. But it's so much more than that. It's this sense of freedom and autonomy that comes well before you get to that point of financial independence. It's not a binary thing, guys. I think that's what a lot of people get lost in is it's either zero or one. It's I'm not financially independent or I am. And until I get to that point of FI, nothing changed or nothing got, got better. And that I, I reject that completely. I mean, for me, the benefits start accruing on day one because like so much of what you guys talk about, it's a mentality. This is a mind game. It's about taking these little actions to make your life better from day one and to, as we say, step off that hamster wheel, that keeping up with Jones's nonsense that society really imparts on us and just making slightly different decisions that actually empower you, that give you a sense of control over your life as opposed to that elusive they. You know, I hate that bullshit, right? Like, oh, they, they control us, they this. But like, how many times do you hear people in regular life talking about they and how somebody else is impacting them? Whereas when you start saving money, and guys, that's the thing here. It's not, it's saving money, not as deprivation. So many people think of saving money as akin to a diet. Hmm. Oh, I'm going to go on a budget for 60 days. All right. You know, that might save you a couple hundred bucks. Good for you. But that's not going to make systemic change, right? It's when you reframe saving money from this is akin to a diet to, wow, I'm going to take control of my life. I'm going to have a degree of autonomy and freedom that I didn't have previously because that very first time you have 
$2,000, $5,000, $10,000 in the bank. You know, I'm talking just getting started. How much more power do you have at your job to say no to some nonsense that you fundamentally disagree with? If your life does not fall apart in 60 or 90 days without a job, how much more power do you have? Hmm. Right? I mean, think about that. Like how many people live on that knife's edge of if I lose my job in 60 or 90 days, my house is gone. My life is gone. What the hell do I do? Because I've been living paycheck to paycheck. How does that help them show up at their job when some, when their boss says, oh, you've got to do this. And they don't fundamentally agree with that. Right. Right. They're in a hostile environment, whatever it may be, they don't have any power, but you have power when you have money saved up. So truly it starts from day one. Yeah. And Brad, I think there's, there's a statistic and, and I may get some of this wrong, but like 40% of Americans don't even have an emergency savings fund. Like there's zero, like if anything goes wrong, they don't have a single dollar of which to rely upon. So that's one issue. But this, this bigger issue that you're talking about is if you don't have, and you're not consciously choosing to save money as a means of freedom versus deprivation, like you're talking about, then what are you beholden to? in life, right? Then you're beholden to keeping up with the Joneses, beholden to that job you don't like, beholden to those feelings of I'm never getting ahead. So that's super powerful stuff that you laid the tracks for. How about talking about your story? Like what brought you into this like financial independence world? And then it was kind of an unlikely story about how you became, you know, you and Jonathan became leaders in this like global movement around five. So talk about the humble beginnings in your world. <laughs> Yeah, humble beginnings indeed. And as you wrote it in your book, On Purpose Leadership, it's following your greatest energy. That's kind of what I've, I've always done. It's, it's this meandering path. There was never, never, ever a master plan as, as uh, will be evidenced in the next couple of minutes, certainly. It's amazing where life can take you, frankly. And yeah, I mean, for me, I, like you, Dom, we actually met at the University of Richmond. Great school. I was an accounting major, went to work for one of the biggest companies in the world. This is certainly dating us here, but in 2001, Arthur Anderson had this Enron scandal and nine months later, this company didn't exist anymore. I realized how impermanent jobs could be, how much those outside factors can influence you. And even when you've quote unquote done all the right things and you need to insulate yourself to again, take that control onto your side of the ledger, as opposed to like, I looked at people who were partners there and they lost everything in a blink over nothing they did. And, you know, many of these people, again, they were living paycheck to paycheck. It, it, it almost doesn't matter how much money you make, because if you spend it all, your net worth is zero or worse, negative, and you are poor. You are not wealthy. You are poor, regardless of your income. So to me, that was one of those kind of awakening moments of, wow, I need to take control of this. You know, saving money just became a really critical portion of our lives. And, you know, in fairness, some of this was hardwired. I have always been financially minded a little bit. I always saved some money, but it was never like something that was at the forefront of my mind. You know, luckily, my wife, we, we both kind of shared this mindset to a degree, but we both were there when this accounting firm went poof. We realized we wanted more out of life than just working. 40, 60, 80 hours a week just to have this, this carrot of being a partner or being, quote, successful. We saw the successful, in very ironic air quotes, <laughs> the successful people at our office, and they were there at two in the morning stapling tax returns with us, you know, and not seeing their family or not sleeping, you know, hopefully at that point. Ugh. It didn't seem like something we aspired to, yeah. you know, it wasn't, that wasn't, if this is what, the carrot is after, you know, 15 years of working in this firm, like, I don't want that. That's, that's not what I want. So how can I take control? You know, for us, it was, all right, we're going to save significant amounts of money. We actually did move from Long Island, New York, which is high cost of living back down to Richmond. And that was a significant change, but it's coming back to that mindset. It was a mindset of, we want to step off this hamster wheel. We can be successful based on normal metrics, but we don't want to be. 
Yeah. It started with a choice, right? I mean, you were talking about, I mean, you, you, you're very familiar with the concept of drift. You're in the great man mastermind. You've read that winning the devil. I've come on your show a couple of times. We've talked about this. Your audience is very familiar with drift. And what you just described were you had a chance to witness all of these ironic air quotes. Is there any other kind successful people <laughs> yeah. who had burned the candle on both ends of their lives for what? You know, and, and watched their, uh, unfortunately, in many cases, watched their life savings go poof or had, you know, abdicated ownership or leadership of their own lives to, to some other ideal. And fortunately, you were able to see that very early on. So, so you broke free from that. You and Laura make this big decision to move from Long Island to, to Richmond. And one of the things I wrote about in my Bach, you know, where you're featured in. <laughs> Is, is limited is edition Bach. The limited, limited yeah, very few. Yeah, the, the the few who have the limited edition Bach will know that you and a family of four live in Richmond, Virginia, own a house, and all expenses that you incur over the course of a year total up to forty thousand dollars. Two young children, mortgage. All expenses forty thousand dollars a year. How the hell is something like that possible? <laughs> yeah, I, I just saw Brad's face light up. I saw this. When yeah. You said forty thousand yeah. dollars. He like, gets that's excited. A smile you yeah. can't just make up. Yes. No, no, that's <laughs> awesome, Brad. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so in fairness, that, that number has gone up a little bit. You know, which is kind of part of the journey, also. Which you know, you make intentional decisions. But yeah, I mean, for the first ten years, ten plus years, we lived here. That 40,000, that was spot on. Nothing about this is deprivation. I mean, guys, if you saw our lives, we are living the same middle or even frankly, upper middle class life as anybody else, just with a couple of little, little pivots. You know, we don't look at any of this. And I, I know I keep saying this. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but none of this is deprivation. Truly right. none. Right. It's more, how do you win at this game of life? That's how we view it. So Laura and I have become closer where so many people argue, so many couples, hmm. spouses argue about money and money is such a point of friction and stress. Hmm. It's the polar opposite for us because we, we know what we want. We wanted Laura to be able to stay home with our future kids at that point. Like that was, that was the short to medium term goal. The long term goal was financial independence. So when we have that as the guiding light, driving 2003 automobiles, you know, who the hell cares? They still get us places. Like we have plenty of money. We don't need to prove to anybody by driving our BMWs or whatever, you know, no issue with people who, who value that, but we didn't at all. What are you driving right now, Brad? Uh, 2003 Honda Civic. Yeah, you are. Nice. How many miles on that thing? It, you know, it doesn't have that many because that's the thing. I don't drive. <laughs> I'm at home all the time, you know? So it's got 126,000 miles on it for a 17-year-old car. It's not bad, I right? expect more. Yeah. Okay. The thing is, I don't care. I could buy any car I want in cash tomorrow, but I drive the car 50 miles a month. So to me, that dis that one decision was probably worth I don't, I mean, three to $400,000 over the last 15 years, not having that car payment. You know, I, ha I haven't had a car payment in 12 years. You know, you don't think of that as a long time, but in 12 years, $400 a month or whatever a normal car payment is like compounded over 12 years. That is a, that's a big decision. And then over time. the next 25 years, you know, right. like you take that, that money that is now $400,000 saved over the next 25 years. That's you're talking right. potentially millions. how many times does that double? Yeah. Right, <laughs> yeah. Brad, you, you started this podcast with, this is a mindset. I'm recognizing as you're telling some of these stories, you're highlighting some beliefs, maybe even lies that are in my head. Ooh. And I'm, and I'm curious like, what are some of the lies or beliefs that people have that, that you see that are starting out? This one in particular for me is when you said you had a 2003 Honda Civic, the lie that was in my head was, well, that's actually going to cost more because you're going to have the maintenance and you're, it's not safe. You've got two kids like that's that can't possibly be safe. And I'm recognizing like I, I hear people that I've, I've learned from in my past that tape playing in my head. And so I'm curious, like, maybe that is a lie. Maybe it's not a lie. Sounds like it is. Um, but I'm curious, what are some of those beliefs that limit us from getting to FI? Yeah, Brian, that is a heck of a question. 
just off the top of my head, I mean, and I would have to think about this deeper, certainly, but the biggest lie is that other people care about what you're doing. Nobody gives a shit about you. you honestly, <laughs> nobody thinks about you. Nobody worries about you. Nobody cares if you're driving a fancy car or living in a big house, or you just got something new. Like think about the last time your buddy came to you like, Hey, Brian, I just got a new car. You say, Hey, congrats, man. It looks nice. And you never think of it ever again. <laughs> you know, that guy just signed up for $40,000 worth of payments to feel good for 30 seconds. Do you care? No, of course you don't care. It is literally the utility of a car is to get you from point A to point B. And I'm harping on cars just because it's an example. I guess I would reframe the question to what are you looking to get out of something? So for me, like another major area of saving money is when it comes to food and entertainment. We could afford, quote unquote, to go out to eat every single night. We could go out for drinks, you know, Laura and I, and we could, you know, that would be fine. That wouldn't hurt our budget. You know, it would obviously cost a lot more, but it wouldn't hurt us financially. But we said, what are we looking to get out of this? And what we were looking to get was time together. For us, what we do now is at five o'clock every single day, we have happy hour together. Every single day, no, no matter what, at 4.40, I go down into our beer fridge down in our garage and get two craft beers, put them in the freezer, and 20 minutes later, we have happy hour. Because the experience for us of going out for $8 beers to a crowded place where we couldn't hear each other, that wasn't what we were looking to get out of it. We were looking to get undivided attention from each other, right? And just kind of connection time. So if we can do that for a dollar fifty, you know, per craft beer each every single day, and it'd be a better experience, right? Because it's not loud. We don't have to drive anywhere. We don't have to get dressed up. Like all this stuff, that's a win for us. It's the same with dinner. We're looking to experiment with new foods and have delicious foods, et cetera. But like Laura loves to cook. So for her, it would actually be a detriment to go out five times a week because she genuinely loves to experiment with new meals and, and such. So this is saving money. It's saving time. She gets to have fun with a hobby that's hers. That's just a huge win for us, you know? Yeah. So, and I was going to say, Brad, on this point, like, like how intentional you two are. And I, I'd like, I love the fact that you're talking about how money has split other couples apart or becomes a source of tension. And then you've used that to go deeper in your relationship. There's that intentionality. How about the guy, you know, going back to your BMW example, like there are some, there are some people who buy the BMW because they're trying to keep up with the Joneses. But what room is there in this, in, in the Fi conversation for the guy who's like, no, I buy the BMW because I love how it feels every time I put my key in the car, every time I sit down and I feel the leather seats, I, I have the surround sound music, like every day I get into the car and I love what I experience. And I have that experience for these three years or five years or 10 years. And that carries into every other part of my life. Is there room for that guy? Yes. Wonderful question. And yes, there is more than enough room in the financial independence community and, and movement for that person. Unquestionably. I think we at Choose If I, if I can kind of humbly say this, we have reframed the conversation. This being a movement of kind of frugal weirdos, right. which is honestly what it was, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it was like, you know, people eating brown bananas and, <laughs> you know, like reusing paper towels and, you know, all this oh, other God. nonsense, right? Like, <laughs> like, yeah. like parsing out their, their toilet paper, like one square at a time. Yeah, one square <laughs> at a time. Yeah. <laughs> you know, to this being something that regular people can see themselves doing and can see themselves succeeding with. I think a lot of it came down to precisely what you asked about, which is we've used the phrase, actually, uh, uh, one of our early listeners, this, uh, orthopedic doctor who's a wonderful guy, like he wrote in this email to me. He's like, I consider myself a valuist. Like that's the phrase. I'm not a frugalist. I'm not whatever. I'm a valuist. And you know, that's kind of a phrase that I've kind of uh, stolen maybe, you know, half as my own with a bunch of attribution, obviously, but I'm a valuist. I'm not frugal. I'm not cheap. I buy based on value. And for that person, that, that man that you described who just genuinely loves cars, spend as much freaking money on cars as you want. As long as you're doing it with intentionality and with eyes wide open, then spend to your heart's content if that's what you value. But 
being mindful that this is this is an equation, right? This is a math game at the end of the day. If you are saving zero dollars or you're in the negative, you're never going to get to a place of financial comfort, right? So something has to give. And what I would say is, as long as you're doing this with intentionality and saying, okay, this car costs me X number of hundreds of dollars a month that fits into my plan, then wonderful. That's great. And, you know, guys, I talked about this on our Great Man Mastermind. Like, I literally just bought a Concept2 rowing machine that costs like $950. It's literally worth more than my car. No joke. <laughs> like, it is actually verifiably worth more than my car. Is that something that a frugal weirdo would do? No, of course not. Right. Like, you have a, a sauna at home too, right? Then you buy like one of those saunas as well. I, yeah, I did. You know, you, this focus on health is is really a big deal for me. Yeah. Because I've always had this limiting belief or this story beaten into me, if you will, of how, oh, we have, us Barrett's have terrible genes when it comes to uh, health and longevity. I hit the genetic lottery in a lot of senses, but like in, in terms of uh, health and longevity, we've been told that, oh, we're going to die young and, you know, nobody's lived past 65, except, you know, all this bullshit. And like, I want to do everything I possibly can to stay healthy. Like we were talking before about breath work, meditation, all this stuff. I'm doing what I can to be healthy. And I bought a infrared sauna that I love. I'm not sheepish about that. Like I don't, I'm not embarrassed about it. It's just, it's something that I value. Whereas we don't go out for fancy dinners all that often, though, you know, we do occasionally, certainly. I'll spend on my health and fitness all day long. This idea of having a plan and a discussion is really resonating with me. Every time I order from Uber Eats, <laughs> like I, I'm, and Brad, I just did some quick math over here. So forty thousand dollars a year divided by three hundred sixty-five days is about one hundred and ten dollars a day. When I order Uber Eats from Becca and I, it's about <laughs> seventy-five dollars a pop. Oh, Brian. So, right, exactly. So, I would be shamed in the FI community for ordering Uber Eats. But, and, and I know that's not okay. I know I want to move away from that only because I feel that that's too much money. That's re a ridiculous amount of money. Well, yeah. and, and not to talk over your question, but like you wouldn't be shamed. You wouldn't. But you know that that's drifting financially. Like, that's right. That's you... right. I shame myself for this. <laughs> and I assume the they of the they FI community would also shame me because I shame myself. <laughs> um, but, but here, here's what I did. I was like, okay, that's, that's an insane amount of money for a single meal. So I went out and I found this healthy, inexpensive frozen meal plan. Let's call it. And instead of spending $75 on a meal, we end up spending 20. That's moving in the, at the very least moving in the right direction. But Becca was like, why did you just do this? Because we had no conversation. It was just me uh, feeling something and then making a decision and her being like, the freezer's not even big enough to hold this because we live in an expensive <laughs> small apartment in New York, right? But there was no plan. It was more of like just just shooting at whatever was coming at me that didn't feel right. And so this idea of a plan and what you said, what you and your wife found was for happy hour, you didn't care about the scene. You cared about the time together. And wow, like what a cool experience to to feel fulfillment in these things that maybe came along with a price tag that doesn't need to. So I that's a place that I'm certainly going to start. And I hope to maybe talk through where we start in, in some of those conversations. Yeah, that is a really great observation, Brian. And, you know, it's so many people I see listen to our podcast or read some other finance book or whatever it may be. And like, they get all these ideas. Their minds go in a million miles a minute and they want to make changes and do this, do that. And like, they haven't had that conversation with their significant other. I mean, you talk about stress, like what just happened to our lives? I love our lives. Like, you know, I love getting Uber Eats every night and trying new restaurants. That might be something that's really important to her. You need to have those conversations because yeah, we've seen so many people just freak their spouse out like, hey, we're going to all of a sudden save 50% of our income. Right. What? Excuse right. me? Like, are you, where, are you kidding? Where did, me? That, where did that come from? Right. It reminds me, reminds me of some of the guys that we've, we've talked to before that have some sort of sexual fantasy. 
that, <laughs> that just start doing it with no conversation. You're and right. yes. and their, <laughs> their significant other is like, what just – who are you right now? Yeah, you come out like dressed, dressed as a Furby and you're like, let's get it on. <laughs> and and it's like you didn't – there was no heads up on this. Yeah, it could be quite <laughs> jarring. <laughs> quite jarring. Bye is the Furby. <laughs> I like it. Guys. Frugal like Furbies. It. I like it. <laughs> you know, so Brad, like one of the things that – you know, I, I posted a photo to your Choose FI Facebook group yesterday, 70,000 members members that are in that group, at least at the time of this recording. And I said, I'm, I'm interviewing Brad tomorrow. I need your help. You know, what has been the things that you've learned from Brad and Jonathan that have helped, you know, change your lives. And one of the key themes that came up time and time again was that they said the five movement had been around for a while before you guys came along and the nuts and bolts of the math, right? The math is the easy part. We want to talk about the math in a few moments, but it's the psychology of phi that, that is the more difficult part. And what I keep hearing you come back to over and over again here is, you know, really phi is a, it's like one of the ultimate personal development journeys that you can sign up for. It's a truly inner work game because everything that I'm hearing you share from a story perspective, from a Laura and, and you perspective is like, we had to get so intentional around what we wanted with food and with experiences and with our relationship before you started saying, okay, you know, now I'm ready to save 50 to 70% of my income. Is that, is that a fair assessment? Yeah. yeah, it is. I mean, to me, phi is the epitome of anti-drift. It is, it is the polar opposite of drift because you have to be locked in, you know, on what do you want out of life? The money the nuts and bolts of the money, that really truly is the easy part. The math's not that hard. I probably spend, you would think, oh, I'm a, a CPA. I have a big personal finance podcast. I must think about money all the time. I think about money virtually zero. Hmm. I say on my podcast, I spend about 10 minutes a month on my personal finances. It's well less than an hour. It's probably somewhere between 10 and 60 minutes a month. Hmm. No joke. That is not hyperbole because everything's on autopilot. All of that stuff works fine. It's that beginning of the journey, trying to figure out what are you looking for? And, you know, guys, I, I did a presentation on in our Great Man Mastermind a couple of weeks ago, and I focus almost exclusively on this, this why, the why of Phi. And, you know, I think in fairness, I probably left some of the guys wanting on like real specifics of, okay, what's the silver bullet? Just tell me what I need to do. And, you know, I, I'm jokingly putting words in their mouth, obviously, but I do hear that sometimes. Okay, what's the thing? Right. The answer is, and again, this goes back to your question about that guy who just loves the fancy cars. That's wonderful. Go do that. Spend your heart's content. It's not my place to say. So that's why there is no silver bullet. There's no simple answer. It's, it's based on what you value. It's based on what does... What does your situation look like? I don't know everybody's situation, their income, their expenses, their goals, like how much they have saved, what their net worth is. You need to figure that out on your own, but rest assured, you need to take action. That was one of the, the big themes. You know, I, I did see that post, Dom, and it was, it was awesome. Like one of the big themes that kept coming up, everybody was saying one thing they focus on at Choose of I is action, action, action. Yep. Yeah. Life is simply not going to be better until you get up off that couch and take action. Brad, I'm realizing that the two beliefs, may, and maybe this is an, another lie, but what you're talking about, and I see the book right behind you, it says, choose FI. Like, it's a choice. Choose FI. Brian's belief has been, FI happens. <laughs> like, FI, I'm just going to keep doing life, and I think that FI is going to happen. Right. And that's how I've been operating and how I've made decisions. And there's a lot of blind spots in that for me. So uh, when I hear you about this intentionality and figuring out what do you value, a valueist, I mean, this, this seems like a whole area of my life that I've, I've lar largely just left in the shadows and said, eh, it'll happen. Yeah, Brian, you're right. I mean, it's, uh, it is about making that intentional choice. It's amazing how how we see people come to us and say like, oh, I had this plan. Like my wife and I, we sat down, we said we're going to pay off the mortgage in 10 years, you know, something that sounded crazy to them. And then they'll come back and say, oh, and we paid it off 30 months later because they just got down to it. It was this goal that they had together. 
you know, this doesn't mean that they were pinching every penny. They just, they found a way to make it happen. They focused on it. And again, it was that intentional choice. And I know this is one random anecdote. You know, it, this actually, I am thinking of the particular person who sent me this story. So this is not like an apocryphal uh, made up thing. Like I do see this over and over again. It is about that intentional choice. Or, you know, again, like probably a better example would be, hey, we had our phi number, which, you know, we can get into the math, you know, maybe, maybe this time we could do a follow-up if, if you guys think it might make more sense to, to split it up. But like, hey, we thought we were going to reach financial independence in 14 years. We looked at our assumptions and we realized, okay, if we could make just these couple little other changes, that might mean making some more money. It might mean asking for a raise, you know, it's not always cutting guys. Like, I think that's another important thing I yeah. want to get out here is you can't cut your way to five tomorrow. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. It's an equation. It's how much you earn minus what you spend equals that gap. And then how you invest that gap. So you can increase that gap in either side of the income or expense. I think it would be helpful at this point to go into a little bit of an overview of the, the nuts and bolts of what does it mean to achieve financial independence? And while you're about to prepare to talk about that, one of the things that I want to say from my own personal experience is it feels like now there's more room for how I'm living my life to fit into the financial independence lifestyle. Because in my mind in the past, I had this, this viewpoint of if I wasn't saving 50 to 70% of my income, then I wasn't FI. Like I, I wasn't in alignment with, cause that's, that was a big part of my misconception about everyone in this community is saving radically so that they can, you know, become financially independent in three to five years. But here's the thing. I'm one of those people who've made the conscious choice. Like I love New York city for a variety of reasons. Like this is my home, my heart. It gives me, it lights me up. I'm inspired here, but that also comes with a hefty mortgage payment. And then also like just all of the other costs of living are much higher. I'm also huge into personal development. I'm also huge into my own personal well-being and nutrition. These organic foods and these things cost money. Coaches that I pay for, experiences. And what I'm what I'm hearing now is that like there actually is room for all of that. Now, in my equation around FI, it may require that I need to make much more money than someone else who's much more satisfied with spending a lot less in other areas. And that's okay too. I just need to recognize the game that I'm playing because it always comes back to intentionality. Yeah, recognize the game you're playing. That is the perfect way to put it, Dom, because yeah. I think the early caricature, there were a lot, frankly, of early caricatures uh, of the financial independence movement. Again, those frugal weirdos, it was a lot of engineers, white engineers in their 30s and single, like it, it was all these characters. Single. Yeah, you can understand why. It's like, I'm going to eat brown bananas. <laughs> I'm going to wear the same t-shirt that I got for free at some conference. 2002 car. Yeah, I can understand why it's single dudes. <laughs> I wonder why they're single. But it's a much broader tent now. It truly is in, in every way. Like you said, we have 70 plus thousand people in our Facebook group. And I think we did a survey. It was like 54% of them are women. Hmm. which was just interesting. It was pleasantly surprising, let's say. And then again, it's not just you need to save 60% of your income and get to FI in six years. You know, now there are all these other terms of like coast FI. This actually reminds me of, of maybe what you might do is like you get to a point where, okay, I've saved enough money that now that money will grow and I'll reach FI eventually. And now I just need to break even. So I'm coasting on yeah. my path to five. Like, you know, there's people who fat fi or who want to just spend $200,000 in financial independence. And that's great. You know, like every single year that's, you know, fat fi, whatever it is, like huh. there's lean fi, there's all this other nonsense, huh. right? Okay. You know, the larger picture is this is a very, very large tenant. It's based on what you want to get out of your life. You don't have to save 50%. There's not that weird caricature anymore. This is for the three of us, you know, it's for regular guys. It's for people who, however they envision their lives, it just allows you to put that extra bit of intentionality there. Love it. So then what would be some of the nuts and bolts at a high level of someone who's like, okay, well, how do I figure out my financial independence, my fine number? All right. Yeah. I'll try to keep this <laughs> as short as I possibly can here. I, I think what FI does is it kind of reframes the conversation. 
if you look at traditional retirement calculators or you hear the gloom and doom in the media of, you know, somebody like Susie Orman, oh, you need 10 to $15 million to retire. Well, thanks, Susie. You know, like <laughs> I can't get to 10 or $15 million. That's not plausible. So what does your mind do? It shuts down and it says, ah, screw that. I'm not interested. That's never going to happen for me. That's for the top 10th of a percent or hundredth of a percent. So I'm out. Whereas we reframe it to something, it's control what you can control. You can control your expenses. Now, again, as little or as much as you want, I have no judgment on that. So Dom, if you, you want to live in New York City and get a bigger apartment, just go do it. That's wonderful. But like, right. you know what that costs you every year, right? right? So it's not some mystical number, some 10, 15, 20 million dollars. It's not based off your income because that's a fundamentally flawed starting place, which you see most retirement calculators start with your income. Fascinating. Which, that's right. Right? Like, think about that. That is so fundamentally flawed because inherent in that, there has to be savings. You, by definition, will never get to retirement if it's based on your income and they're presupposing you're spending all of your income. Yep. Every financial retirement calculator you've ever seen is completely flawed. And yep. nobody seems to understand that. Like all that matters, what do you have to do at a point when you have, when you're in retirement, whatever, early, regular, whatever retirement, you need to cover your expenses. Right. So why don't we start from there? Well, <laughs> we in the five community, that's where we start. And Dominic, I think you said you're going to live to 121. Yeah. Put that in your calculator, Brad. Like, holy <laughs> shit. That's a whole other variable. <laughs> we need new assumptions for Dom, I think. But, that's right. yeah. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it's find what your life costs. That's the most succinct way of doing this. Don't BS anybody. Like, this is just about you. I think that's one of the hardest things. You know, we talked at the very beginning of this, guys, about money being that last great taboo. And that's even to ourselves. How many people do you think have ever sat down and said, Hey, this is what I bring in. This is what I spend. This is what I own. And this is what I owe. I mean, what, one out of a thousand, one out right. of, I don't know, one out of right. 500. I don't know. It's something on the order of that. You need to be brutally honest and don't beat yourself up. You know, I have made catastrophic financial mistakes, you know, me, and I still reach five well before I was 40. I mean, I'm talking guys, catastrophic financial mistakes, like with ill-fated real estate investment, but you can't beat yourself up over decisions you've made. You've made them. You just need to make decisions today, tomorrow, and every tomorrow thereafter to get you to your goals. And but to that point, the conversation about who actually sat down and calculated their expenses, like one out of a thousand people. I remember when I was thinking about leaving my 15-year corporate career at Prudential, my heart was set on it. My soul was set on it. But there was still this crippling fear of something nebulous and it was my finances. I hadn't ever done the math of how much I spent in a given year. Like, what were my expenses? And it was only when, and it was after a conversation with you, because you and I started our monthly calls like four or five years ago, where I actually sat down and I was like, how much do I spend in a given year? And like these things that are non-negotiables. And when I got my number and I looked at what was in my bank account, and I was like, if I'm the worst coach, speaker, podcast, whatever it is, like in the, and no one pays me a dime. I can actually live for in New York city for five years, not having to alter my lifestyle without having to like, you know, reverse mortgage my home or to tap into my retirement account. And just doing that math was what allowed me to make that final step where I said, after doing that math, I'm now going to live the life of my dreams. That exercise is that profound in understanding where are you right now? Yeah, that is super powerful. You get that understanding, good, bad, or indifferent, right? In your case, it was good, but for many people, it's not going to look so pretty. And that's fine. You just you you have need to, to know. Realize, you, <laughs> yeah, you have to know and you have to, frankly, like pat yourself on the back and be proud of yourself for, for sitting down, for taking those couple hours and doing that. So, you know, getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. So just going back to the actual math, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you start with your expenses your annual expenses. Now, obviously you can look at kind of your monthly expenses and multiply by 12, but of course life is lumpy, right? Like there's always those one-time things, there's trips, there's, you know, there's all this stuff. Like there are, you get flat tires, right? Like most people 
can't even cover one flat tire expense, which is a whole separate issue, obviously. But for this calculation, you, you need to just figure like, there are going to be some monthly expenses that come up that you just, you can't even identify gifts. There's all these things. The point of this exercise is being honest with yourself. Find out what your life costs in a given year. Actually, this is the, the funny thing. This is the, the easiest part is to get your financial independence number. You just literally multiply that annual expense figure by 25. Yep. Let's say, for instance, just simple math, your annual expenses cost 80,000 double what my life costs. 80,000 times 25 is $2 million. Yep. You hear that in the financial realm as the 4% rule. I hate the word rule because it sounds way too authoritative. It's, we call it the rule of thumb because it's a very fluid number, but at least it gives you some, something to shoot for. So how this works is, let's say you have $2 million. You can take 4% of that out each year, which, you know, again, since we've done the math, 2 million times 0.04 is 80,000. That covers your annual expenses. So that amount can come out. Now, theoretically, that money is invested and it's growing at hopefully 7, 8%. You're pulling out 4%. There's some inflation. So actually this is adjusted for inflation. So when Dom's 120 and a half, right? Like <laughs> he's, he's not still pulling out 80,000 in this hypothetical, right? right? Like this has been upwardly revised for inflation. When I'm 121, my, my whole foods run will be $80,000. Seriously, so, each yeah, week. Each I week. got it. Yeah. <laughs> so that rule of thumb, I'm not telling you that you are 100% at FI when you've hit that 4% rule. Got it. But you know, we have uh, PhDs in economics who work for the Federal Reserve in our FI community who've run like every Monte Carlo simulation you could come up with. And like, you know, he said like 999 out of a thousand or et cetera, et cetera, you know, to that order. 3.25% or 3.5% withdrawal rate is going to be as safe as humanly possible. So even if you wanted to say, hey, take our annual expenses and multiply by 30 or 33, like that's fine. It's really the point of having that understanding that there is a number and there's a number that's within my reach in a 15, 20, 25 year period. You know, if you're saving 20, 25, 30% of your income, putting it in, you know, in our estimation and low cost broad based index funds to give you the highest percentage likelihood of success. There's a reasonable chance that you're going to get to a point of financial independence before that retirement age, when frankly, most people can't even dream of actually retiring because they've saved nothing, right? So even if you don't quote unquote early retire, which, you know, frankly, guys, I reject that whole nonsense anyway. Like this is about the financial independence. It's not about sitting on a beach somewhere doing nothing. It's about the independence factor. It's not about, again, that caricature of the fire movement, the early retirement. That's just a distraction. It's about understanding that you have control over your life. All right, Brett, I'm, I'm convinced. This sounds like a more powerful way to live. And I do understand the nuts and bolts of it in terms of getting to the fine number. Going back to the psychology and the how-tos of this, let's say I'm ready to do this, sit down, look at my finances with my partner. Where do I start that conversation without sounding like a crazy person? Yeah, that without sounding like a crazy person being the uh, optimal part of that. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I, can, I can see how this goes. We live in New York City. And I come at this, I'm like, well, we need $7 million in the next seven years. So we have to move to Alaska. That might not come across well. You know, I could take the easy answer and kind of say, blame it on me. I'm saying this jokingly, but like, we always talk about breaking free of drift. You know, we talk about living intentional lives. We talk about development and improvement and living these holistic lives. I just, I came across something that I think adds to that. You know, I'd love for us to explore it together. Hmm. And I think what, what we've seen, we've set up a couple of episodes, you know, if I could indulgently plug my podcast here is like very specifically for this exact conversation, which is, you know, way back in episode 38, we called it the why of Phi. It's really honing in on like, what are you looking to get out of life? Why would you pursue financial independence? We have an updated version of, of that with a little, a little more of the, of the numbers in there with episode 100 is kind of like that intro episode. And like, we've had so many, so many couples, significant others sit down and listen to those together. 
and finally have that, that jumping off point. Like it, it gives permission, you know, to have that conversation as opposed to just like, Hey, I really want to sit down and talk about finances. Think about like how defensive. Yeah, that, that sounds like not a great idea. But what I do like about this is, and you mentioned this in the beginning of the podcast, is like this is a way to connection. And whether it's going on dates, whether it's physical connection, this is like another way to connect. And I really, really like that. And so I think that's going to be part of my frame coming into this is like there's this crazy Brad guy, this whole community. <laughs> And there's maybe a new way for us to connect on this. Like, let's figure out what's important. And this is something really actionable too, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it really is. I think, you know, that would be kind of the next step. It's just taking these tiny little steps, these little actions that just, they start snowballing and you start realizing like, oh, wow. Like all of a sudden I went from a 0% savings rate, right? Or whatever it is, you know, five, 10 to we've made these couple little decisions in our lives and now our savings are up to 15%. And you know what? We're not living a worse life. Like, I think right. that is so critical. It's like mm -hmm. proving to yourself that like, this truly isn't deprivation. It's a trust, trust Brad, but verify clearly. <laughs> it's so important. And like every single week I send out an email to our, our whole community and I ask them to hit reply to me and say like, Tell me what are the actions you took this week? I literally want to know. I'm going to respond to every single one of these. I want to know what you've done. And like, you know, I'm just looking at a bunch of responses here. If you guys would bear with me, I'm going to read a couple of them. Sheila said, I, I took the $50 a month I saved from cutting the cable cord, which adds up to $600 a year. And I threw that into my index fund at Vanguard. Hmm. Chai said, this year's tax refund went straight into high yield savings account. This helped me reach three months of expenses saved as an emergency fund. Hmm. Wilea said, my husband and I set up solo 401ks for our small businesses. My first contribution just showed up in my account this morning, and I was able to purchase some shares of a nice, low-cost total market index fund. We're both hoping to max out our 401ks this year. It's so exciting. And then down to little things, like a month into working from home as a teacher, I realized I stopped exercising, and I was stuck in front of a screen the majority of my day. I was looking into a treadmill desk, but they're too pricey. So I decided to make my own <laughs> for about $16. I mean, it's awesome. That sounds like, like a Brian thing, man. You could do that. Yeah, yeah, dude. I gotta send you this picture that she sent me. It's amazing. For $16, she made a sturdy treadmill desk out of particle board and velcro straps. We talk about 1%. We talk about the aggregation of marginal gains. These little things, when you add them up, you add, add, add one little thing after another it snowballs and it turns into something magical. And then your mindset changes, right? Your mindset changes from a, oh, I'll just buy that. I'll just graze, right? I'll drift to, oh, wow, I can do that. I can yeah. come up with a novel answer for this. Yeah, they say that constraint breeds creativity. Right. Yeah. And by having this mindset of here's what I'm going to play within, it naturally leads us to creative solutions, which is exciting. It is. And, and here's the thing. Here, here's the clincher is, Brad, I've been around your community for the past few years, whether it's been in the Facebook group, I've been on your show a few times, and I've had a chance to meet some of your community members in person. And just as you were describing the emails you got, my experience with your community has been, everyone's excited. Like you talk about, it's not about deprivation. They are so excited and proud of these commitments they've made, of these wins that they're experiencing. Two of the men in the Great Man Mastermind, Ryan Eller, Patrick Devlin, found their way to us because of your podcast. And those two guys are so enthusiastic about the changes they've made in, in an intentional financial lifestyle living. So you've taken this community where like it used to be frugal weirdos and turned everyone into sexy valuists <laughs> and and like and you can see that people get really excited about this journey. So I think one way of closing here is to just share with you one of the men in your um, Facebook community. His name is Tommy Dogs. I don't know if that's his real name. It's, if that's his real name, that's amazing. Tommy Great Dogs. <laughs> that's amazing. He said, "I want to make sure that Brad knows how grateful so many of us are for the efforts of the entire Choose Fi organization. My life." And so many others have been forever changed for the better as a result of your efforts. You know, you're talking about millions of people who listen to your show on a monthly basis. You have 300 community, five community groups in local cities 
and towns across the world, people taking back command of their financial present and futures. Like I see you and Jonathan as two men who are really putting a dent in fucking humanity, doing the work that you're doing. And I just want to thank you for that, man, because we've needed it for so long. So thank you for showing up in such a big way. Thank you, Dom. And thank you, Brian. I really, yeah, it's, uh, it's humbling. It's obviously, it's, uh, <laughs> it's still hard to wrap my mind around that this thing has grown so significantly. But yeah, I mean, it's struck a chord in people all across the world for same reason what you guys are doing. It's, you know, people want to be more intentional. They want to live better lives. They want to have control over their lives. I think this helps get them there. It's when, when you have your money under control, you can focus on, on all these other things that you want to spend your truly valuable resources on, your time, your energy, your love, right? Like, I mean, you can focus on that. Getting the money straight, it's like the linchpin. It, it makes everything else easier. All right, like I promised, here is your call to action. What is the one thing that you are gonna take from this episode and put into action in your life. It can be a small thing, it could be a big thing, whatever it is, what's the one thing that you're committing to taking and putting into action in your life? Because otherwise, this last hour has purely just been an educational information masturbation session. If you can do better than that. And also, if you want bonus points, head over to the Facebook group, the Great Man Within Podcast Facebook group. It's for men only, sorry to our women listeners, but some places men need to go on our own and share with the men in the group the thing that you're going to be putting into action. And this is where men come together after our episodes and talk about what they liked from an episode, relate, share stories, keep each other accountable, head over to the Facebook group, The Great Man Within Podcast, and tell us what action you're putting into place, or even better yet, the action that you already took. Hey, did you get something of value out of this podcast? If so, I'm gonna ask you a favor. Would you be so amazing as to go over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and a review? Your ratings and reviews can show someone who's just discovered our podcast for the first time that we are worth listening to, and that way we can reach a wider audience. So please head over to Apple Podcasts, leave us a rating and review. You rock. You rock.